that, we can kick it off. Um, so once again, welcome everyone um, to this session. This is the first webinar in a series of three. Um, to kick things off, I wanna do a bunch of really important thank yous. So the first one um, is thank you to the Leisure Studies Journal and specifically the Maureen Harrington Fund, uh, which provided the funding uh, for this series of workshops. It was originally intended to uh, take place in person last summer and we got delayed, but we're really excited about the opportunity to do it virtually and to share with more people. Um, really excited to see the range of people who have joined from uh, really all over the world. Um, so thank you so much. I'm excited to uh, learn from and discuss with everyone today. Um, also need to give a thank you to all the people who have kind of supported this along the way. Um, so we uh, developed these with some input from an advisory board who gave us some feedback and direction. We have a great series of um, speakers lined up for the three sessions. Um, and I'll give them each kind of their, um, their own acknowledgement as we go through. Um, and one other kind of housekeeping thing that I would like to let you know is that we do have the live transcript function. So uh, at the bottom of your screen, you see the option to have live transcript. You can turn on your closed captioning here. Um, so if you click on that and then click um, show subtitle, it will provide you with the text on the screen as well. So we'll leave that running um, for the whole time. Um, and then a couple other things. Actually, we'll take a quick break in the middle before we break out to the uh, breakout sessions. So uh, you can plan for that. Know that we'll have just a quick couple minute break if you need to uh, step away for a second. Um, and we'll also, we won't be recording the second part of this session. So the second part will be, is designed to be more interactive. We want people to have kind of a free flowing conversation and feel free asking questions in a smaller group setting. So the smaller group settings won't be recorded, only the first half. Um, and while we are um, working, working through this first session, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. You can um, just um, put them in the chat. You'll see the chat icon at the bottom. You can drop that there and you can um, let people um, know what your questions are. Then we can pick them up as we go. We will move through the session um, kind of in, in one sweep and then we'll come back to some questions towards the end. So if you wanna drop them in as you go, um, that is great. You all should have received a delegate pack. Um, we sent it out earlier this week and then again in a reminder email uh, just a few minutes ago. So I will just um, ask you to check out some of the information there. We have a lot of information that we've put in there so we don't have to cover too much here. So um, please take a second to look for that. If you haven't received it, maybe you, you just signed up recently or for whatever reason it didn't go uh, to your inbox, you can just send a message to the panel. So if you just send a, a chat to the panel only with um, your email and we will get that sent to you right now so you have that resource as well. Um, one other thing when we have our um, cameras on we just ask that everybody um, is aware of in the room be ready to be sharing be um, you know presenting yourself appropriately as if we would be in a, an in-person meeting. Um, and uh, just know that that will be coming in the second half. So um, if you would like to leave your camera off, you feel free to, no one needs to, uh, but if you are going to, we just ask that you join as you would um, with an in-person meeting. Um, we will be doing these three sessions in a row. I'm gonna give you the quick overview of all of them, but uh, just one important thing to note is that it's the same Zoom link for all three meetings. So you only received one link, that will be the link for all three. We will do our best to get the recording turned over and posted before next week. So if you'd like to go back and review some of it, um, you certainly can do that. And so with that, I think I'm gonna give us a quick overview of our three sessions. So um, broadly, the aim of the, these three webinars is to critically examine and promote the use of participatory action research within leisure studies with a view of enhancing the impact of leisure studies scholarship, uh, specifically for those who are engaged in and affected by the research. So um, with this in mind, we kind of collected some feedback from a group um, of people that were engaged with this, um, and we did develop these three sessions. Um, we really wanted to focus on the, the really the practicalities of doing this. So as students and early career researchers, we found ourselves you know, looking for these resources on really how it gets done and how to navigate some of the challenges that come along the way. Um, and we felt that that is a really important resource that we can um, create for others and a, and a piece that we, we wanna share um, and help along the process. 
So with that, we've designed three sessions. I'll give you a quick kind of overview of each of them. Um, so the first session, which we're in today, is broadly looking at research design. So how we approach uh, the process, how we navigate partnership, how we engage with um, different um, groups and individuals through the process. So really here we're looking at discussing the design of participatory action research projects, looking at some of these challenges, and then highlighting the importance of um, building trust and navigating the, the research process. I'm going to introduce each of these panelists uh, just before we start, um, but I just want to give them a big shout out and a big thank you um, for all their support in this. Our next two sessions um, are going to be focused on um, the kind of a bit more specific processes um, within participatory action research. So the second session um, will be facilitated by my colleague Robin Smith and Dr. Carlo Lughetti, um, as well as some of their participants and co-researchers that they worked with. Um, and this will look specifically at data collection methods. So participatory data collection methods, um, navigating those processes of participation and some of the ethical and practical challenges that we may experience there. The next and final um, session will be facilitated by our colleagues, Dr. Chris Webster and Dr. Arti Ratna. Um, and this will look at data participatory data analysis and representation. So looking at a few different um, methods of data participatory data analysis, um, highlighting some of the importance of um, decision making within that process and the potential of data analysis to be transformative or to transform into action um, and highlight, again, some of the practical and ethical challenges on this process. So again, thank you to all of the panelists and participants who are going to be working with us. We'll get a much more um, in-depth introduction to each of those persons during each session. Um, and so we look forward to, to welcoming, them in, welcoming them in as our facilitators in the, the next two sessions. So um, with that, I'm going to keep us moving along. So before we get started, we wanted to give people just kind of a brief um, introduction or overview to participatory action research. Um, we provided a few kind of pre-reads, so we hope people have had a chance to check out those references and the information that's in the delegate pack. Uh, but just to make sure we're all on the same page and to give folks who may not be as familiar a brief introduction, I'm going to uh, turn it over now uh, to my colleague, Robin Smith, who's going to give us a quick walkthrough of some key principles of participatory action research before we get into our panel discussion. Thanks Kyle, uh, my name is Robin, I'm one of the event organizers and I'm also a doctoral researcher at Brunel. So this short presentation is very much intended to be a whistle-stop tour of PAR. It's an intro from my perspective as an ECR who has used PAR um, over the past five years or so within the context of sport and leisure studies with migrant and refugee youth. So the intention here is to really try and provide some context around the methodological and conceptual dimensions of PAR more broadly. And many of these nuances I'm sure will come out in the panel today and also in the following webinars. So here in the audience, we're really fortunate to have folks with different levels of experience using participatory methodologies, from folks who have been using participatory approaches for years to people who are keen to explore the possibilities and expand their knowledge in this area. So to get started, let's explore some of this diversity in experience. So I've created a little um, Zoom poll here. So please fill it in and let us know whether or not you have used participatory methodologies before. I'll give you a little minute. Okay, 10 more seconds. Fantastic, okay, we've nearly got everybody. Okay, so from the people who have voted, um, it's looking, oh, people are still voting. Okay, let's share the results. Okay, so 54% have used participatory methodologies and 46% haven't. So it's pretty um, equal distribution there. So now it'd be great to kind of find out a bit more about what types of approaches you have used. So please feel free to write in the chat and let us know which participatory methodologies you have used.
I'll just give you about 30 seconds or so. Nice, okay, so Audrey has used CBPR. Okay, CBPAR, Maddie's used PAR. Perfect. Okay, PAR again, participation research, action research. Okay, Caitlin's used lots of different approaches, fantastic. Okay, fantastic, yeah, it's a right mix there. Beautiful, right, Chris has used co-design. Fantastic, right? It's great to see the variety there um, in the different approaches being used. And I think we can really kind of see that diversity around participatory methodologies. So while these webinars are focused primarily on PAR, you know, there is a lot of overlap between these approaches. Terms can be used synonymously and folks can also draw from various approaches as well, as we can see from Caitlin, who has used about five different approaches. So what all of these approaches have in common is that they involve doing research with the community rather than on the community. And as a result, we see a shift in the degrees of power and participation throughout the research process. So I'm now gonna speak a bit more specifically about some of the origins of PAR. So PAR is derived from both action research and participatory research, and projects can be situated at various points among this continuum. So action research was first developed by Lewin in the global north within industrial relations. So through engaging practitioners within processes of planning, reflection and action, it was found to promote problem solving and lead to outcomes such as increased efficiency within industry. AR is functionalist in nature. It aims to promote change from within the current system. As such, we see that AR is commonly used within organizations and the public sector to improve services. On the other hand, Participationary research emerged in the global south and is embedded within critical theory. Freire popularized participatory approaches as a means to support the participation of the community in processes of knowledge um, production and social transformation. Through supporting folk to critically reflect upon their realities, it was suggested that they may gain heightened awareness of the social forces that reproduce inequalities which may in turn empower political action. So the wonderful Dr. Carla Lugetti is going to explore this much further within webinar two. So I will leave you waiting until then. So PAR was first coined by Faust Border and it blends strands of PR and AR, as I just said. So inspired by AR, PAR integrates the cyclical processes of planning, action, and reflection. And then from PR, PAR added the participationary to action research to signify a commitment to challenging hegemonic structures and fostering social change. Okay, I'm not going to debate the definition of PAR. We will be here forever otherwise, and that is not the purpose of this at all. But there are an established yet contested set of principles that underpin PAR. The first is that it requires authentic participation of stakeholders throughout the research process. And these degrees of participation are ultimately underpinned by the quality of relationships between stakeholders. But participation is contested. Who is involved? To what extent? Who is benefiting? And what does that give and take actually look like? Secondly, PAR requires a shift in power throughout the research process. So Cornwall and Dukes argue that the greatest differentiation between participatory approaches and more traditional qualitative approaches is the shift in power from the researcher to other partners throughout the process. So they ask us to consider who defines the research questions, who actually generates, analyzes, represents and owns the information which is sought. Thirdly, a key component of PAR is recognizing that the partners involved in the process are knowledgeable actors. At its very core, it's challenging the hegemony of expertise through centering and valuing local priorities, knowledge and perceptions within the research process and really fostering this process of mutual learning and exchange. 
From an ontological standpoint, Paris concerns both with exploring people's lived experiences in a way that is meaningful to them, and also working in solidarity with communities to influence change. So from this standpoint, we see that a commitment to activism is often centered. And our role is not that as a removed storyteller who is detached from this process, but instead we're working in solidarity to promote social transformation and also transformation within ourselves as well. And following on from the last point, reflexivity is positioned as a critical component within PAR. And many scholars would argue that reflexivity goes beyond simply stating our positionality, but it's rather intentionally embedding multiple forms of reflexivity throughout the process interrogating our histories, our power and privilege, and really exploring how this impacts the spaces that we're in and our relationships with others. And lastly, ethics is centered throughout PAR. We see that the values of collaboration, trust, integrity, and do no harm um, are incredibly prevalent. And Dr. Caitlin Nunn, I'm sure, will explore this further um, within the panel. Um, but as we know, um, ethics are contested institutional ethics procedures are often counterintuitive to actually facilitating uh, participation and action throughout the process. In terms of research design and PAR, I think it's really important to recognize that no two PAR projects will ever look the same. But for the purpose of providing some practical content, more generally speaking, projects can progress through a series of general stages. So this list, list sorry, is adapted from Kinden, Payne and Kesby. So for those of you who actually have experience using PAR, you're probably chuckling to yourself and thinking, wow, like I didn't know the process could actually be this straightforward and linear. So instead, this table here would probably much more accurately represent my experiences of the PAR research process. Um, so it's important to know that these phases are rarely linear and the actual stages will look different in each project. So the process often begins with establishing relationships with participants, agreeing a time frame and the project scope. Going from there into actually building these relationships further, building that trust and rapport, identifying roles and responsibilities and going through institutional ethics. From there, deciding on the research questions, the issues, to co-designing the research process, to implementing data collection, to analyzing findings, and then sharing findings and planning action. So as you can see, we have action and reflection at each stage. And this really allows for the stages to develop iteratively. It gives the opportunity collaboratively to revise and to rethink. And because of this, the stages are rarely linear. There's often shifts back and forth and the content of each stage often looks very different for each project. We also see that the language used on this list here places emphasis on collaborative decision-making at each stage. And while many of us could agree that power shifting and participation are key principles of power, it's prescriptive to actually suggest that these will be equally distributed throughout because it may not actually meet the needs and interests of your group. For example, many of my co-researchers, actually all of them, haven't wanted to be involved with analyzing transcripts or you know, writing up uh, academic journal articles. And it's okay that, you know, for different stakeholders to be involved in making decisions at different stages of the process. So really what we have here is a flexible and iterative research design. And this is really exciting because you never quite know where this collaboration is going to take you. But also as an ECR who is embedded within institutional structures and laying at the perils of precariarity, thanks academia, um, you know, navigating this uncertainty and the complexities can also be really challenging. So today we're going to have a look at how some of these complexities actually play out throughout the research process. And then in webinars two and three, we're going to look more specifically at the ways in which we can meaningfully promote participation within data collection and analysis. Perfect, right, that's all from me folks. I am going to pass you back over to Kyle to introduce the panel. 
Awesome. Thank you so much uh, for that succinct and super helpful overview, Robin. Um, hopefully that set us all kind of on the same page here with some of the key issues that we're going to talk about. So thank you so much. Um, so yes, with that, we're going to roll into our panel. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we will kind of flow through all the panels, um, questions that we've got set up for them, and then we will uh, invite questions from the group. If you'd like to share questions as we go, you can drop them in the, in the chat, so please feel free to do that. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our four panelists. So first up, we have Professor Audrey Giles. She's a professor in the School of Human Kinetics at the University of Ottawa. She's an applied cultural anthropologist and her research focuses on the intersections of gender, culture, and place within sport and leisure. She conducts research with indigenous communities in the Canadian Arctic and Subarctic. And Audrey spends her spare time running, baking with a ridiculous number of chocolate chips and spending time with her beloved dogs, Echo and Bubba. And uh, Bubba is not feeling well. He's post surgery, so we're wishing him well today. Um, second up, we have David Meyer. David has worked in education for the last 20 years and is currently a lecturer in sport coaching and development at the University of the West of Scotland. His research interests include um, sport and education and the connections between the two. This has enabled him to focus on a number of different issues at the intersection of sport, education and development, including sport for development, inclusive practice, community cohesion, physical education policy, social change, and critical pedagogy. Dr. Caitlin Nunn is a research fellow at Manchester Center for Youth Studies at Manchester Metropolitan University and an honorary research fellow at La Trobe University, Australia. Caitlin's research is located at the intersection of refugee studies and youth studies, focusing on the lived experiences of refugee background youth and young people in the United Kingdom and Australia. Much of her research is produced in collaboration with young people, youth engaged organizations and artists using participatory and arts based approaches. And our fourth panelist is Dr. Laura Meisner, who is an associate professor and director of the School of Kinesiology at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. Her research focuses on how sport and events can be used as instruments of social change with an emphasis on how sport for persons with a disability can positively impact community accessibility and social inclusion. Her research program is interdisciplinary in nature and pushes the traditional boundaries of her field to emphasize the importance of critical scholarship for innovation. So welcome to our four panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited um, about the discussions that um, we're going to have. Um, so we're going to stop sharing our slides here. So just so everyone knows, the uh, the full screens are on now, so we can um, see everyone's uh, videos. Um, and so to start, I think I'm going to start uh, with Dr. Audrey Giles. So uh, welcome. Um, I'm wondering if you can start by providing some background into what community advisory boards are and their role in the research process. Sure. Um, I think, you know, when you're doing research with a community, it's really important that it's by, for, and with community members. And that means you cannot do it alone and that you cannot be the person who is making all of the decisions. So in order to facilitate um, shared decision-making, it's really important to have a community advisory board. And sometimes they have just like slightly different names, um, but essentially what it is is this group of people from the community uh, that you are doing research with and they are there to help to support the research and sure that their actions um, that their decision like i said the, the decisions made reflect what they would like to see done and to ensure that the research is conducted in a way that is ethical and meaningful to them so on a community advisory board you would usually have uh, research the researchers but then also members of the community and what's really important to remember is that, um, you know, community, we, we tend to think of community in warm, fuzzy ways that like, oh, everyone gets along. And, you know, like um, Ziggy Bauman has, has a great quote about how, you know, basically community can't be thought of as bad. Uh, but we all know that when we are parts of communities, there's always conflict. There are always hierarchies. Uh, and so when you look at your community advisory board, that's something that you really have to take into account. Because as soon as you're deciding that, you know, 
these five people represent the community and know what the community wants. You're telling everybody else that they are not as knowledgeable as these people potentially. And whether or not that is your message, that is what can be heard. So it's important to not just select people who are all from the same group, but really to try to have a diversity of voices and experiences. Uh, it makes for a richer experience, but it also makes for a very complex one. Uh, you know, also decision making about who should be on that committee can be tricky too. Um, I don't think it should be the researcher's decision alone. Uh, if you're in a community where there's leadership, they would they should have some sort of voice in it as well. Cool. And um, you you kind of alluded to it, but how do you go about? Um making those kind of, uh, having those conversations, I guess, and making those decisions and figuring out who, who those people are. Yeah, I mean, my research is with Indigenous peoples uh, in the Canadian Arctic and Subarctic. So when you're work, when I'm working with those communities, there's each community has either um, a band council, a municipality, a Métis organization, um, an Inuit organization, for instance, so there's very clearly representatives there. And sometimes you have all of those in one community. So talking to all of them and asking, you know, who do you think should be on this committee? And then saying, okay, um, how do we get some diversity? How do we get um, different voices? So talking to them and then making some practical decisions about you know, making sure in, in my community, in the communities that I work in, for example, uh, it, you have to have an elder, right? So making sure you have an elder. It's really important to have youth voices there. It's really important to have both male and female voices there. Uh, if you're working with communities where there is, um, you know, openness around sharing uh, sexuality, gender identity, those are also really important to have. And again, this doesn't mean that you're going to have the most cohesive committee, but it's one that I think better reflects the community. Cool, thank you. Um, and so a bit of a leading question because we understand that you're currently doing some research on specifically using advisory boards. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us just a little bit about that project. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's community-based research on community-based research, really. Um, so there's lots of layers to it. So we have an advisory board. Uh, and so just to say how we made the advisory board, basically I put out on social media that I was looking for uh, members of the community advisory board uh, and people who had had experience on community advisory boards. And uh, I was very lucky to get people who had amazing experiences. And so then we worked together to come up with some questions about what we wanted to know about the experience of being on a community advisory board. The research is usually written from the researcher's perspective. And there are so many articles about how tricky community-based research is, uh, but very little from the participant's perspective. So we kind of wanted to flip the gaze there. And it's been really fascinating. Uh, the people who've been leaders in community-based research are people in the HIV AIDS community. They were in it from the beginning saying nothing about us without us. And so that's a great body of literature to look to if you're looking uh, at kind of descriptions of the community-based research process. Uh, and some organizations have come up with checklists of things that you need to do. Uh, at the same time, we've also heard about some really terrible experiences that people had. Uh, so we are interviewing people from who have been participants in all sorts of participatory research. And one woman that we worked with had been um, a victim of sex trafficking. And she said that the principal investigator on the research grant, um, she felt like she acted like her pimp. And I mean, that, like, you know, basically like, took my breath away. Uh, and she found this, the experience to be, um, I think traumatic would be a, a good word for it. And so really just looking at these full ranges of experience um, has been really illuminating for me. Um, and I look forward to the pandemic kind of settling down a bit in Canada so people get their lives a little bit more back on track and we can start up the research to do a few more interviews. Cool, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, can you, so you've kind of given us a little bit um, there, but can you give us kind of a sneak peek of maybe what uh, some of the findings are, the, the themes are, or your reflections on it? Yeah, um, I think that it's really important to help the people on the community advisory board to develop all research skills. And 
I totally agree that most people do not want to be involved in the, the analysis, but I think that's because they often find it really intimidating and that it's totally possible and manageable to have community members involved in that process, but it takes time. Uh, but through that, people can really gain skills and that can be really helpful for them in terms of looking for jobs. Uh, and that the people who have been involved in community-based research are very committed to it and want to continue. And I think as researchers, we can help to better set them up for that. Uh, I think that another important thing to look at is payment. If you, <laughs> I always think it's amusing that as researchers, we're the experts, but then we need advisory committees. Right? and we're interviewing people because clearly they have, they're experts on their own lives and we need this information. And so it's really important that people are paid or somehow um, you know, given, given credit or some form of um, re remuneration for their work because it is labor, it is intensive, it takes them away from other opportunities and expecting people to do work when I, as an academic, am being paid no matter what, I'm salaried, but expect them to volunteer to me is, is really deeply problematic. And I know how hard that is when you are a student who you don't have your own money, right? But there are other things that you can do, I think, that are really meaningful. So help people to build their skills and help them to build their CV. Uh, ensure that you provide a meal for them when you meet. If you are meeting in an actual physical location, I look forward to the day in Canada when we can do that again, um, that you're providing like bus fare or you're driving them home and you're providing childcare. So really thinking about the sacrifices that people are making to be involved in your research and valuing that. So I think that that's where people start to get resentful when it's like, well, you're getting paid for this and I'm doing this all in my free time and I have to incur costs along the way. Um, the participants and the research that I've been doing have found that to be unacceptable. Cool, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna move along to the next one, but do you have any kind of closing thoughts or things that you uh, would like to add that we uh, didn't cover? Um, I think just making sure that if you say you're going to be making decisions in terms of a group that you actually follow through with that because uh, you know, there's used to be people say, oh, you're gonna be involved in every step of the research. Okay, so this is what we're doing, right? And there's a, there's a disconnect there right from the start. So if you can like back up and really have people involved from the beginning and deciding what things are gonna look like and it's gonna make your life a lot easier. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, next, we're gonna to move to David Meyer. So uh, welcome, David. Um, we're really excited to have you here to talk specifically about uh, some of the challenges that you've encountered in your work. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the aim and objectives of uh, your project that you wrote about um, in terms of the challenges. Okay, so <clears throat> basically the aim of the project was to try and address issues which were uh, evident within the, within the town of which I worked uh, in terms of community cohesion. Um, so whilst people describe it as, a, as an ethnically diverse borough, essentially it was it was kind of ethnically divided geographically, socially, economically, culturally, not so much economically actually, but culturally as well. And so I was thinking about how we could use sport as a way to try and bring those different uh, communities together within the town. So I worked at the college, I was a, a lecturer in, in further education at, at the college, um, uh, and lots of experiences with young people within the borough and seeing the, some of the issues that are being faced. So if you walked around the college, for instance, you would see this clear division uh, just by walking through the campus. And so it was an idea by which we wanted to use sport or to try and engage with young people as a way of trying to address some of these issues. Um, so we have young people from the college and also young people from a local youth project. And initially, we interviewed a lot of them, focus group interviews, to get their views around social cohesion and division within the borough, uh, and also to generate their ideas around how sport could play a role in seeking to try and address, uh, to try and address some of those issues. From that, we got young people to volunteer to be part of a project, uh, to design an intervention, a sport-based intervention, to seek to address that. And then the intended aim at the end was that the young people would actually put that intervention into practice and we would review it and reflect upon it. Uh, so those were the, uh, the aim and objectives of the project. 
Cool, thank you. And then um, can you tell us a little bit about how it played out and, and you know what actually happened and what some of those challenges were that you encountered? <laughs> yeah, I mean, although I worked at the college, I was external to, to the youth centre. And therefore what I had to do, I sort of transitioned it over to the, to the youth workers to run the project with the volunteers. So um, I was not embedded within that organisation where uh, sort of the project was taking place and being developed. Um, and so you I give out, you know, a lot of control over to, to other people within that process to run that. Uh, but ultimately, I think the major issue was that the idea was uh, ultimately it was mine and initially driven by me. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily driven by the young people initially. So it's my observation for what I was seeing around me and thinking about ways in which I could actually address uh, some of those issues. But it wasn't organic. It hasn't it didn't come. Uh, from the young people themselves, and therefore that automatically causes an element of, of, uh, of problems in terms of the fact that, you know, I'm going here with this project, these are the issues that I see, what do you think about these issues? So it wasn't organically uh, created. Um, and ultimately I had to, you know, sort of relinquish control of that process in order to make it participatory. So I was taking a, uh, a big sort of step back away from that. Uh, and so it's very difficult to, uh, in, the, in the way in which we designed a project, to relinquish that control. And ultimately, that became a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit problematic, um, because we didn't necessarily foresee a lot of the wider problems that the young people who are part of the project were facing. Uh, the borough itself is one of the most deprived boroughs uh, in the UK, and so wider social economic. Uh, and cultural issues were impacting upon their capacity to, to engage uh, in, the, in the level that we had hoped they would be able to. And so we really struggled. We worked really, really well initially and worked really, really well up to the point where it had to actually be put into practice. And then it kind of fell apart from that point. So a lot of these things could be based around, let me say, the wider issues young people are facing there, levels of self-esteem and confidence to be able to do such a thing. Uh, and the challenges that perhaps they felt that they were unable to, to rise to. So essentially we, we perhaps, or I perhaps, underestimated the size and the scale uh, of the challenge. Um, and I think also when I reflect back on it, because it's, it's a while ago now, and when I reflect back upon it, I think the biggest issue uh, with the project design was that I was trying to address a macro level problem with a micro level intervention. So we were trying to address an issue uh, which the local council, lots of community groups, the national British government had failed to address. And yet here we were with a group of young people who were facing multiple challenges trying to address uh, that issue. And so perhaps it was too ambitious. Um, and the reality was we were looking really as sort of looking at a social transformation framework that perhaps this concept of social transformation to transform something, to make something completely different to what it was, was too ambitious. And we should have been more focused at the, at the micro level and more small scale incremental change uh, from the outset, I think. Cool, thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, your, your own experience navigating that process? So, you know, what did it feel like? How was it like for you as a, um, you know, as, as a researcher? Um, well, I think just to give it a little bit of background, I was, like I said, I was working at uh, an FE college, so I wasn't working at a university. So I had no, none of the potential support structures uh, that you might find in, a, in, in academia. Uh, so FE, just so people know, it's, it's what young people in Britain go to between school and university. It's like vocational, vocational education. Uh, and so it's just something that I was really, really interested in and I wanted to do, and I wanted to engage with it because I, I could see these issues around me. Um, and so I think I was definitely naive and underprepared for, for, what I was, for what I was actually doing and putting into place. So when the project started to not go as we had hoped and we had intended, uh, you know, I definitely felt that we, I'd sort of lost control of that process. And it was, it, it was very frustrating because it had been so good up to a certain point. Um, 
But ultimately, I think the feeling that I had was that others, including the sort of the facilitators within the, within the youth centre and the college with which I worked, were not as deeply invested in the project as I was. So I had ceded control to enable the project to be participatory. But the people who were now sort of delivering the, the intervention and working with the young people were not as deeply invested in it as I was. So that became, uh, that was part of the issue, I think, as well. But obviously that created a sense of frustration in me that the, that the original intentions of the project were not actually going to be realised. Especially as, you know, you put so much work into it and you, you, you want this to work because you feel that it's going to be uh, really beneficial for the participants because they're going to be able to do something of real value, but also potentially and hopefully uh, beneficial for the community. So it was, it was, it was disappointing on, on that scale more than anything else. Um, but then, it, of course, it's a process of reflection. So you then start to think, out, think back about, well, what have been the positive elements within this project? What have the young people actually taken from this project through being part of that process? And actually, initially, for the first time, potentially in their lives, to be asked about these highly complex issues, uh, which influence their day-to-day -day thoughts and, and perceptions around their communities. So we had to focus very much on the positive elements around that. So the engagement of and the ideas explored by the young people. And then also, you know, for probably part of the reason why, why I'm here is really what can be learned from this process and learned from for other people who are looking to put such a project in place. So just really briefly, can you give us uh, one or two of those, those things? What are the lessons that we can take away um, practically? Um, I think that a massive advantage uh, in a project of this nature is to be in some way embedded uh, in, an, in the organization where the research is taking place. So <clears throat> that means that you can actually respond to uh, ideas that develop organically within that organization rather than it being perhaps prescriptive and external. Um, so although we had people who are part of the project working within, within the organization as well, it was something that didn't occur or didn't uh, wasn't created organically. It was, it was an external idea which was then taken into the organisation. And so, the more that you can be embedded, and even if it's volunteering within within where the research is taking place, that would be hugely beneficial. Um, I think, as I said previously, it was ambitious uh, the project, but I think that ambition was sort of tempered by the reality of application. And so I think it's a balance between trying to be ambitious in terms of achieving something of real value and of, of change, but also dependent on who you're working with, in the context in which you're working with, and whether or not that, that ambition can be fully realized within this type of process. And I think also from my perspective with working with young people, <clears throat> especially in, in an area essentially of deprivation with lots of other wider challenges, um, we were expecting a significant amount from those young people, but we wanted it to be the young people that drove that project. We wanted it to come from them and their ideas uh, as the future of the town, so to speak. Um, but I think a deeper awareness really of the broader challenges that they were facing on a day-to-day -day basis would have been uh, beneficial and putting much more support in place uh, for those young people. Um, and I think building what on what Audrey has said, you know, we did have people backing us in terms of the college, the youth organization, and certain people within the local council. But as I said, really, they weren't as deeply invested in it. And so it's about trying to build that network of people within the community who are going to be highly supportive of the process which is being undertaken. Um, <clears throat> I think maybe the last point really is to start uh, with the notion of social change and really thinking about what is it that you are actually trying to change? Um, what is the change that you are actually envisaging within this project? You know, why is it required? Um, and what are your sort of intended outcomes and why? And really who is going to actually benefit from, from such a process? Um, and ultimately, you know, in whose vision is the change really being intended? And I think when I think back, back to my experience, you know, the vision of change was potentially mine 
even though lots of other people shared it, that the vision of change was mine and it didn't come organically. It didn't come out of an organic process. And so that, that created uh, a number of problems within the project. Cool. Thank you so much. I can definitely see some of the, the overlaps already in these, these different ones, but I'm looking forward to moving along here. So thank you so much. Next, I'm going to um, flip over to Dr. Caitlin Nunn. Um, so Caitlin, welcome. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us a bit of background on your own experiences um, in using uh, different types of participatory methods. Sure. So I guess I want to start with a disclaimer, um, which builds on, on Robin's kind of discussion of the complexities of the different kinds of participatory approaches to say that um, I've worked across a spectrum of participatory approaches um, that's, that kind of range from uh, what Franks calls pockets of participation, where there are small participatory dimensions within projects, all the way through to, to what we would kind of consider pure par. Um, the majority of my work is um, participatory arts-based research. Um, so this is research which brings together kind of the democratizing um, non-hierarchical ethos of power with using art as a way of, of producing knowledge. Um, and so I, for me, that's really about privileging and amplifying marginalized voices and experiences, but also using the affordances of art um, for accessibility to non-academic audiences in terms of communicating um, research. And also uh, kind of in that more Frarian way, looking at um, alternative modes of articulation um, and challenging uh, dominant modes of articulation. So arts-based research is allowing us to get into more effective embodied um, forms of knowledge that are perhaps harder to capture in more conventional research. Um, so, you know, I've done everything from um, from Papa -pa Project, creating zines with refugee background young people, um, working with a community health service and a refugee background community to produce a resource to support health service providers to better serve the needs of refugee background clients, um, a participatory evaluation of youth and play services, so a range of things, including visual arts, music, digital story. Um, I've been around a while. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for folks who may not be familiar, can you just give us an example of what an arts-based approach uh, might look like or might entail? Sure. So, um, I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's different in different projects. Let me maybe just um, talk about the zine project. So this was, was a, a PAR project. So I spent some time with a group of young people who migrated as separated asylum seeking children to the UK as, um, as part of a program with the Children's Society. Um, and then we, um, I put to them, you know, what, what they wanted to talk about and they really wanted a way of challenging dominant representations of their experiences. Um, and so we used a zine format in that case. And in that case, it was really about the fact there were so many diverse perspectives in the group that there was no way of producing a coherent um, output. And one of the great things about art is that it allows us to have this kind of polyvocal um, output. So a zine let us do that. So the young people um, identified the themes they wanted to explore, and then they uh, used each page of the zine to explore an issue. And then a smaller group of the young people um, then came together and they looked at all the zine content and from that they decided on the policy and practice recommendations they wanted to, to offer as part of that zine. Um, and I'll, I can share the link to that for everyone to have a look. But I mean it's important to say that's like one specific project, um, they manifest in a whole lot of different ways. <laughs> Totally. No, no, thank you. I just wanted to give kind of an example for people who might not um, be as familiar. Um, great. So. Um, we often talk about um, power methods as being theoretically underscored by redistributing power um, within the research process. So what does this mean for the ethical approaches that we, we kind of use in our research? Yeah. Oh, I could talk about this all day. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, <laughs> I think so. I, I guess the important thing here maybe is perhaps to distinguish between procedural ethics. So this is like institutional review boards and ethics in practice, which is more the day to day ethical processes that we, we navigate when we're doing research. Um, and Gilliman and Gillam do a really great job of, of exploring this in an article that I know was part of the resources that everyone received today. Um, so as we know, procedural ethics are still very much grounded in biomedical models of research. They can be very maternal in terms of their kind of safeguarding approach. Uh, they're very embedded in hierarchical relations of knowledge and power. And they're based on a set of presumptions of ethical rights and wrongs. 
Um, so, you know, we heard Audrey talk about the importance of, um, of payment, but we still find institutional review boards that see payment as a form of coercion and won't support it in research. Um, another example would be anonymity. So this presumption that anonymity is the most ethical approach to working with participants, where we know, um, particularly from Indigenous studies, there's some really great work critiquing that and suggesting that um, anonymity is a way of erasing the producers of, of knowledge. So I think there, there are some challenges about um, about those kinds of formal procedures. I still think they're very uh, important processes um, for thinking through research, um, but we need to attend to where they might undermine autonomy or where they might even enact violence. Um, so to give you an example, I was working with a recently arrived Muslim um, community in the UK and the university that I was part of at the time uh, the Institutional Review Board required in the consent form for me to uh, outline the limits of, of, of um, confidentiality. And one of those pertained to terrorism, uh, acts of terrorism or funding of terrorism. Now I'd worked really hard to build a relationship with this community. And up to that point, there was never a question that that was a, a focus of, of the research. But by introducing that consent form, all of a sudden that trust was broken and there were questions about what the, what the research was trying to achieve. Um, and so I think, you know, we need to be really careful about where institutional ethics can, in some cases, um, unintentionally produce negative ethical outcomes. Um, and also to say that that's not all um, kind of formal processes. Manchester Met is doing a brilliant job, um, spearheaded by Kate Powell, really challenging some of some of those approaches um, and there are ways around it so for example in um, the zine project that I talked about uh, I had an initial consent process uh, initial ethics process where I said this is going to be co-devised and this is how we're going to co-devise and that was enough to get me in the room to then work with the young people and then go back and submit amendments it was incredibly laborious and exhausting um, but it was the only way that I could create space to actually co-produce the research. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's really important because when I went into that group and I said, this is going to be your project, one of the young men who'd been involved in research before said, but hang on a second, if you're talking to us, you have ethics clearance. So you already have a project, what's your project? You know, so I think that actually, you know, so I think the, these are some of the challenges um, that, that we get into. Um, in terms of ethics in practice, you know, I think we really need to be thinking about honest, transparent, dynamic and, and dialogic processes, um, iterative and multi-level consent processes that um, enable people to develop their understanding of the research. So again, we can think about how institutional processes might uh, be unethical, that if we're working with a group who've never done research before, like the young people David was speaking about, if we come to them with a consent form, they don't necessarily understand what it is yet they're being asked to do or how they might respond to that. And so, you know, asking them to give consent then, that, is, that then binds them for the remainder of the project is problematic. Um, so we need to think about iterative processes that can develop as our relationships develop as young people's understanding or, or community um, members' understandings of the project develop. Um, sorry, I know I'm going on. It's just, it's you know, this is all really exciting and really important. Um, so I, I guess I just want to wrap up this by just saying um, I'm really interested in processes of co-producing ethics. Um, and, you know, one of those is about, that I use is creating a code of respect. Um, so this is about acknowledging that the day-to-day -day ethics of a project are really reliant on the ethical competence of the researcher, but the researcher is situated in terms of class, gender, and culture. And so we really need to have a dialogic approach to ethics that really uh, accounts for different ethical frameworks that, that might be different across life stage, across culture. Um, so for example, I get very uh, worried about um, social media, whereas the young people I work with are very unworried about it. Um, so a code, the way the code of respect works is that we come up together with a list of, of things that guide how we're going to work together. And it's a living document, it comes into every session, and in every session uh, we can revisit it and we can change things. Young people can hold each other to it as well, so I'm not the one that's kind of managing how, how the project unfolds. 
Um, and it means that everyone has signed up to this code um, and that uh, it, it's, it can respond to, to the day-to-day -day changes in the project. Sorry, that was a lot. No, no worries. It was great. That was some really great info. Um, I'm wondering if we can just take maybe one more quick one um, and you can maybe give one example. I think you've alluded to this already, but one example of a way we can kind of embed this idea of reflexivity into the different phases of our, our research. Yeah, so um, I guess there's, there's two quick things I want to say. Um, I, I guess the first thing is that, um, you know, and as I think um, Audrey kind of touched on is I think that you need um, a diversity of voices. I think co-production or, or participation is actually the best way of ensuring reflexivity because you're ensuring that you've got multiple perspectives and you're engaging in dialogue. Um, I think the conditions for that are really important. And one thing um, I really want to draw attention to is humility. And I really appreciated David's account before because I think um, in order to build our careers, it's demanded of us that we present ourselves as experts. But we need to unlearn that in the PAR process and we need to be open to alternative ways of understanding. And we also need to present ourselves in a way that invites dialogue and critical engagement. It can be incredibly uncomfortable, um, but I think it's, it's incredibly important work. Um, and I think we also need to be really careful about building trust and respect in groups and creating the conditions that enable people to be reflexive. Um, so one of the things that, that we often use in our projects is we have closing circles. So at the end of each session, we all sit around and we all reflect. Um, often like I might choose a question if there's a kind of pertinent issue that's emerged or it might be a general reflection about what's gone well and what hasn't gone well. And that means that we're always checking in with each other. We're always making sure that everyone has a voice, that everyone can express any concerns they have. Um, and I think that's a really great way of, um, of making sure we're, we're attending not just to the outcome we're working towards, but really deeply um, attending to the process to, of getting there. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and now I'm going to flip to Dr. Laura Meisner, our fourth panelist. Um, so welcome, Laura. Um, we're excited to have you here to talk a little bit about working with organizations. So I'm wondering if you can um, just give us a, a little bit of an intro into your background of doing um, participatory or action-oriented work uh, with organizations. Sure. Um, thanks, Kyle. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. I'm learning a lot today. Um, so what I will say to start here um, in terms of my background is I didn't come to doing um, participatory research um, naturally, I would say. Uh, I, I have my background and my training is in sport management and in sport management at the time when I did my training, it wasn't really something that people were involved in and it, it was really actively discouraged in many respects because you know many of the things that we've already talked about, it's time consuming, it's, it's challenging, there's ethical issues. So it was really um, sort of, a, it was discouraged. And, um, and I also was seeing people who were engaging in what they were calling participatory research and with communities and I didn't feel like they were, what were they were what I was seeing was theoretical coherence between what they were actually doing and the theories that they were employing very western colonial theories with communities that didn't work so I had a lot of uncomfortableness with the idea of of this type of research so it was kind of a little bit later as I realized that I kind of was already doing this <laughs> and I didn't really think about it that way because I was working with organizations um, and I was becoming uh, was coming to them and we would sit at the table and we would talk about you know how could we develop projects together and what would those questions look like and how would we approach those and then I, then I ended up actually having one organization start um, saying you know we'd like to be involved more and I said great let's talk about it. and we did do some data analysis together and suddenly that's when from a sport management researcher mindset went oh oh that's actually I'm kind of already doing this so I started to explore it a bit more and then um, kind of have, have moved on from there and, and done I would say a spectrum of different things I still do quite traditional research in, in many of my projects but um, also work quite closely um, from a participatory perspective with the number of um, community sport organizations, national sport organizations, and currently um, with an international sport governing body. So I'm jumping around a bit um, on your questions, Kyle, but that's sort of how I came to things. Perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, you've alluded to these different kinds of organizations. Um, can you speak a little bit um, more to the nature of the relationships uh, with these organizations and what that participation has looked like? 
Right. So given that my research is really a lot focused around events um, for persons with disabilities in particular, um, the relationships with organizations have looked quite different depending on the type of organization, um, what the intention of the research has been, and their interest in engagement in the process. So what I found obviously is that not surprisingly, some of the larger international organizations want to be involved, but typically it's a champion from that organization that is uh, really stepping up and saying this is important to us and and I want to be part of this. And so it's really about engaging with one individual. Um, but interestingly, the relationship with those organizations is very um, procedural in many ways. And so as Caitlin kind of alluded to, some of those ethic process, ethics process are really interesting because not only will you then have institutional ethics and in practice ethics, but then you'll also have procedural ethics that go with those larger organizations. So you have sort of this multi-layered approach of trying to navigate the relationship with those organizations, which is um, interesting and challenging at the same time. Um, and then uh, working with some, uh, probably the ones that I, I find most fascinating and is community sport organizations. And those community sport organizations, um, as David alluded to, are often made up of um, local volunteers, parents of the kids who play, you know, this people who are just interested in, and they want to do something. And so what I found in working with um, organizations like this is often you'll um, develop a relationship and we start to develop our questions and our frameworks and how we want to move this forward. And given the transient nature of volunteers in those organizations, we'll see somewhat of a turnover. So, um, so you have to continually work with those organizations to uh, have that ongoing relationship with them because there is such a high turnover rate. And so finding the right people within some of those smaller organizations as well has been quite critical to sort of the ongoing relationship with um, some of the projects that we're working on. Thanks. I'm, I'm currently dealing with this right now, applied for a big funding application and the executive director has now changed. So yeah. hoping yeah. that things are all cool with the new yeah. person when yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. time comes around. Yeah. yeah. Um, Great. I'm wondering if you, so you've talked about it a bit, but if you could speak a bit to some of those common motivations. So the things yeah. that organizations are looking through for through these partnerships mm -hmm. um, and maybe yeah, how, how to go about sussing that out or really uh, um, figuring it out with, uh, with an organization. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important here to take a step back and really start to, to think about um, why you're approaching the organization in the first place. What it is it that you really want in terms of working with them? Um, because a lot of the types of research that I do potentially could be done without uh, participatory approaches. I don't feel that they would be as engaging or as meaningful or really produce the kind of outcomes that we've been able to produce. But a lot of the times I think they could be. Um, but I, I, so I think it's about understanding as a researcher your own motivation for why you want to work and engage with these organizations. So that's the one approach is going and thinking about what's my motivation coming in and being transparent about that. Um, and so oftentimes where I found the best partnerships is those where I've said, look, this is all not doing it questions, these are the kinds of things that I'm interested in, but I would love to explore where that would go with you. And all, and that's where we've seen good alignment is, is there's been good conversations, we've been able to kind of mold and adapt and think about those questions together and be able to move the agenda forward. Um, but it has happened in other ways as well, particularly with community sport organizations in the, in the space that I work in, in disability sport. I now I have organizations that come to me and say, we want to work with you, which sounds like a really great opportunity, but it but you really want to be really cautious and careful about what the motivations of those organizations are. Are they coming to me because they want to work with me on projects and think about this co-creation process, or are they looking for an answer to something and they want me to do an evaluation of that? And so that's, that's a really key piece in understanding the organizations and being transparent about what's my motivation for being involved in this and what's their interest in, in working with me. Um, and so, you know, I have had, so I have said to some, you know, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm sorry, we, I don't think we can work together because they're really looking for something that I'm, I'm not willing to just give over, you know, do an evaluation and step away and not have them involved. And, you know, that's a contract research that's different. Um, and so, and, and, you know, maybe that's another piece, but that's not the type of project that's really about um, involving those organizations in the process throughout. They're looking for an evaluation. So, so making sure that there's a really good conversations that continue and ongoing and is sort of referring to the first question there and as, as Kyle's understanding, when you have turnover in those organizations, which is quite frequent, um, making sure that you continue to talk about the motivation and alignment of the objectives of what it is you're creating uh, has to be quite key. And um, 
and I say that is also part of the challenge because these are, are organizations that are busy and have their own mandate and their own things to do. And so um, making sure that you find the right people and the champions that can really be part of the projects is, is quite critical. So um, not to go too long into this, but the most recent pieces that we've been doing around um, community sport organizations is bringing together advisory boards from different organizations, and they have self-selected those individuals into the into that advisory board to help support an ongoing process, so that it's not as transient with the individuals who who may be there and then leave and then get right so back and forth. Great. Um, so just as one kind of final question before we uh, flip in and open it up for uh, for discussion or for other questions. So if everyone, you can start thinking about your questions, get ready to put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, I'm wondering um, if you have any advice for an early career researcher or a student who is looking or thinking about working with an organization, um, what would, you know, first steps be or something, a resource to read or things like that? Right. Um, so <laughs> to I can always think when you ask me that question, Kyle, um, is that don't do what I did when I was doing my PhD research and someone said, ooh, this is too hard, you can't do this, it's gonna take too long, don't do this, right? Because that was a common common sentiment. I think that's still out there. Um, and particularly in the sport management space, I would say it's probably still quite pervasive. And I think I saw Lorena on the call here as well. She could probably speak to it. Um, that, that maybe that's, you know, you have to think about, again, go back to the central point is what's your motivation? What's your interest in doing this and make sure it's genuine. And if you think you can get the, the kinds of results that you're interested in from a research perspective without this, it's okay actually to step away and say, okay, no, actually, we're going to do this in a more traditional approach. But if it really is a value to you, and it has to be a fundamental value of what you're about and what the research is about, then um, it's about taking the small steps first and finding organizations and individuals within those organizations that have those same value sets and that are interested in that process and asking the right questions, like asking really about what do they value in terms of research? What, what would they be interested in being involved in? So trying to get some of that understanding from the outset, particularly with the organizations and, and the larger we get even more so, um, what would they be willing to commit it to and be involved in because the other piece and we didn't quite get to talking about challenges is when organizations realize they get partway into the process with you working with you and then they realize oh my gosh actually this is going to take up way more time than I ever thought it was forget it I'm out um, and that that's really it's not fun <laughs> and it's, um, so yeah making sure that you're really up front with those organizations when you're approaching them about what you're interested in how you want to go about this process how they would like to go about this process and ensuring that your values align um, and then I think you can move that forward. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. This has been a really um, amazing discussion. I've really enjoyed seeing the kind of um, threads that are woven through um, all these different diverse experiences. Um, so I would now like to open it up to the floor and maybe we'll do about 10 minutes, maybe max of um, open discussion. Um, I see there is some discussion in the chat here that's um, interesting. So I just want to kind of uh, bring it up about um, different ways of engaging with that, that procedural ethics process. Um, so I see, um, I think Madison started the, the conversation. Um, so maybe do Caitlin or Audrey, it sounds like you've uh, chimed in here, want to uh, pick up and elaborate on this a little bit. I think there's some really interesting things about navigating uh, consent forms for uh, diverse folks there. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, research ethics vary from country to country. Country. In Canada, we have a tri-council statement on research, which all researchers have to follow. And I'm on the research ethics board at the University of Ottawa. And I think when we're doing community-based research, we're like, ooh, this is like high-risk research. But joining the REB, I got an understanding of what high-risk research really is. So I have a colleague uh, in nursing, Dave Holmes, who does research on HIV-positive men who participate in orgies in Palm Springs that's high stakes research, right? And so, and his proposal was when I learned that you can ask participants to sign, but using a fake name. Uh, so that's one way of getting around it. Oral consent is another way, but still with oral consent, you have to record it. But I mean, it's basically impossible for people to know if the person is who you said they are. So a fake name is a good way of getting around that. Cool. And, uh, Maybe to flip it over to Caitlin, another thing we've kind of alluded to is the idea of you know building capacity to engage with those procedural processes. Um, you talked about it a little bit, but did you want to comment or elaborate on that? Uh, sorry, I'm just catching up on the comments. You mean uh, how researchers gain capacity? 
uh, or how you can like build capacity with co-researchers, yeah, in, in the process. Um, oh God, <laughs> I was sorry, I was actually thinking more about, about how valuable this moment is actually for building capacity among researchers, because I think this is, this is an instance, I, I think Robin won't mind me mentioning, um, where she shared with me a challenge that she'd had with her institutional review board. Um, and they had been, I mean, what they had suggested was so backward looking and outrageous. Uh, but because she hadn't been part of these conversations, she didn't know that there were other models out there that she could use to kind of push her own review board to think about things differently. So I think rather than thinking about how we build capacity among our community co-researchers to engage with these processes, I think we need to think about how we can build the capacity of institutional review boards to build their understanding of community-based research approaches and to actually demystify some of that and perhaps develop some protocols that we can be sharing among ourselves as a community that means that we're all not fighting these individual fights. Okay, do you, yeah, do you have uh, some examples of, of things you've used um, for those? Then <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, I think this is a real problem because we don't write about these processes and I think this is a bigger problem with participatory action research and I think David kind of alluded to it as well in talking about his experiences is because these kinds of approaches are still so marginal in mainstream research. I think when we write about them publish publicly and to, and to publish in academic publications, we're very protective about about how they work. And I don't think we're always as critical uh, of them and of, of the challenges as, as we could be. And I think if we could be more honest about what some of these problems are, uh, then I think it would give people uh, more confidence and capacity to, to address them. I don't know what others think about that. Yeah, does anyone else want to uh, chime in? I, I think that's I think that's really true. Um, I joined the research ethics board because I was so fed up with the feedback they were giving me, and so I think I'd like to think that I played a role in educating them. Um, but it really should not be up to you know individual researchers to set the records straight. There needs to be some training for um, REBs or IRBs. Mm -hmm. And I would, sorry, I would also direct people's attention in the resources. There's actually a document that was created by the center for social action, I'm going to I'm going to get the acronym wrong. There's a centre at, at Durham University which published a great report about ethics in community based participatory research. I think it's a really powerful tool that we can use uh, when we're approaching our own uh, institutional processes. Right. And uh, yeah, Audrey alluded to it before, but um, in Canada, we have the tri council statement and they have some content specifically on um, on participatory and community based research and what that can look like and um, how to navigate that process. So um, it would be a little bit different, but I would encourage people to check that out as well, just as a, a framework for what that can look like and what one uh, ethics approach can look like. So thank you. Pick up on a comment that Caitlin uh, put in the comments about around payment. I think that's really important. So people on social assistance in Canada, if they get money, that has to be recorded and it's then deducted from the money that they're given by the government. So it's important to not give them a cash that could be traced um, and that you look at, uh, that you speak to them about other ways that you can help them. So like gift certificates, stuff like that, um, kind of ways of their workarounds, but um, it's, it's a really complex issue. Yeah, do others have comments on um, um, remuneration or payment? Um, there's been a kind of a discussion going on here. I'd be, welcome any other uh, thoughts or comments on that. Okay, is there, um, we are getting close to our kind of limit that we had or the, my, my intended time that we had set here. So if there's any other questions, I'll invite people to put them in the chat. Um, but what our next step will be is we will just take a quick uh, three minute break. Um, it'll let us set up some um, breakout rooms. Uh, we'll be in small groups. So hopefully we'll stick it to less than 10 people um, in each group. Um, uh, the, we'll try to be spread out among the different ones. Um, and we will share some um, questions, some prompt questions in the chat for us that we can use. Um, but we will encourage everyone to just um, have a have a chat about whatever it is that you know stood out for you in the panel or things that you might want to discuss a little bit more. Um, so 
yeah, I, I don't see any more chat. So let's say we'll take a five minute here. Um, we'll come back at 20 past. And um, we, at that point, we will engage the breakout rooms. Um, we will also ask if there could be one person in each of the rooms who would volunteer to um, just take a few notes and uh, give us their quick reflections when we come back to the group. This doesn't need to be thorough. It doesn't need to be a, a complete list, um, but we'll just invite you to kind of share what you discussed and um, your, your thoughts. So uh, we'll come back at 20 past. We'll have about 20 minutes in those group discussions, and then we'll come back to the main room, share our final thoughts and discussions. Um, and just to um, reiterate, we won't be recording these sessions. So the, re record, the recording will stop now.